before we get started, I have a couple of requests from our live stream maestro. And that is that when during the Q&A, could you please stand if you ask a question and also give your first and last name and your school. I know that we're a warm, fuzzy, intimate group here, but this is being live streamed for millions of people. <laughs> so those millions need to know your first name, your last name, and your school, even though we all know each other in this room. And I've also been told not to applaud while holding the mic, so I will refrain from doing so. And now, I guess we'll just begin with our panel. Um, no, with you, Autumn. Oh, okay. No, pa I, was, I was going to say panelists. Gotcha. Okay. And do we have somebody on lights? If, if, I'm really nervous. Okay. Um, no, just if there's a video, if you could dim the lights. Is, is somebody available for that or not? Okay, good. Okay, great. Okay. Not now, just if a video starts. Thank you. Okay. Uh, so before we get started, hi, my name is Autumn Harris. Uh, I'm a senior comparative women's studies major from Queens, New York. Um, and uh, I'm a member of Spelman College's curatorial studies program. So one of our assignments uh, for class is to look at a piece of work for up to four hours sometimes and ask, what do you see? And we're asked, what do you see? So um, while I preface my uh, project with this message, uh, please, I ask of you to think to yourself about what you see in this photo. Um, so there. I'm sorry, I'm nervous. <laughs> okay, oh, I should probably bring this down. Okay. So in uh, in 2019, I'm sure we've, uh, we've we've noticed, and I should probably even add, normalized a couple of things. Uh, for starters, you know the sky is blue. None of us is going to argue that. Um, uh, in New York City, you know, if you're in a train car and it's empty, you should probably skip it and go to the next one. It's probably the same for DC. Um, I'm nervous, sorry. And um, another normalized fact is that black male athletes comprise a majority of the players in professional basketball and football leagues uh, more than any other sport and profession in America. And, um, uh, I had all this written down, but I'll just go. So, fast forward, um, and while I'm talking, I, I really want you to think of the parallels between America and Ecuador and my story. So, um, in July, I spent some time in Ecuador, uh, specifically in an area called um, the Chota Valley, which is um, the one place where a majority of Afro-Ecuadorians are, aside from the Esmeraldas. And, um, uh, ooh. Okay. It's free. I know, but it's free. <laughs> okay. Sorry, thank you. Appreciate the support. So, um, so yeah, I, I visited Ecuador not too long ago, and I, when I went, I noticed that you know, just in common conversation among the Afro Ecuadorians there, a lot of them, when asked, "What do you want to be when they grow up?" they said, "Soccer players," and it made me think of my experience in New York and how a lot of them, or a lot of the children that I grew up around, they aspire to be basketball players. And so um, it made me think of how, you know, the face of Ecuador is mestizo, and uh, the face of Ecuador is mestizo, um, but the soccer team shows another uh, unrepresented, underreported side of the country, um, along with the complicated relationship that they have with uh, slavery and the narrative, and just go to the next slide. So here's some, here's what Chota looks like. Um, it's about 50 miles away from uh, Quito. And the closest uh, university is 73 miles away. And while I was there, I spent a lot of time thinking about how place and location and time can really impact the, a human's uh, experience. So with a university being 73 miles away, how, what are the, what's the chances of you? How, do you see yourself there? I don't know. So This is Eliana Carabali. Um, she was my narrator for the story. And um, she traveled every day going three hours to school and then another three hours coming um, every day for four years. And that was rough. She's, but she's currently pursuing her PhD. Um, and that's her younger brother to the left who also wants to be a soccer player. Um, 
And among Afro-Ecuadorians who only make up about 7.3% of, of the Ecuadorian population, the unemployment rate falls between 5 and 7%. And it made me think, uh, if the majority of, if almost 10% of your population, or yeah, if almost 10% of your population is unemployed, how, how, what are the ways that we could develop this and even, you could, oh, sorry. <laughs> I just feel like with this many people unemployed, like what are you doing to your country? Like how is, you could generate so much more money and so much more resources and things if we just invest in certain, we pay attention. So that's, that's it, I'm really nervous guys, sorry, thank you. <laughs> um, so soccer is everywhere when you go to Ecuador. And uh, background story, Ecuador has traditionally uh, had a pretty bad uh, history with soccer and the, the them making it to the World Cup. So fast forward to the first couple of slides. Um, this is in 2006 where uh, they first qualified for the World Cup ever. And uh, a majority of their team is Afro-Ecuadorian. And a lot of them either came from the Esmeraldas or Chota. Um, so there's that. And then um, this is a, a former coach of uh, the professional team. And um, this is something that would also would come up often. Uh, a lot of people would talk about, you know, the muscle capacity and and all these different physical things that make black people better at certain sports. But I and I was surprised to hear this from the coach because he would mention like, and, in the, and I mean even oh I'm sorry <laughs> it's, it's I'm really pa oh gosh okay I'm sorry I'm sorry okay. <laughs> So anyway, um, he mentioned the physical capacity of a lot of these players, and I it, it it made me think like there's people out here who really think that you know uh, black people are just naturally better at sports, but the broader question or the broader answer is that uh, resources are slim, and for a lot of people that's where they see themselves as they see themselves on TV as professional athletes, and the poorer you are, the more likely um, you are to feel this way. Um, and one uh, professor, uh, professor said, the problem is that too often Chotenyo children find themselves exercising their bodies more than their minds. And Eliana Carabali, which uh, you saw before, um, when she heard that, she said, as it reads, um, I don't think so. The line of thinking is this way because options are limited. And many children, especially boys, think to themselves, the best thing to do is to develop my body and athletic skills because this will put my family in a better position. And again, I see the same things in America, uh, specifically in New York, in the South with football. So, with that. And um, this is Barbarita Lara, um, as it states, uh, educator, women's rights activist, and an oral historian. And one thing she said was, the lives of human beings are shaped by many different elements, circumstances, and people that support you. And when asked about education, she said, there's no bad teachers, just teachers with limits. And it made me think of the expectations that are placed upon black people on the court and in the classroom, and whether or not they're the same, they're not. <laughs> and finally, um, this is a local team. Uh, a lot of the kids, as mentioned, they aspire to be uh, professional soccer players. And to many, you know, it, it, uh, uh, a ticket to the professional league can seem as you know a master key uh, to a world beyond anyone's uh, imagination. But uh, what happens when you don't? When you invest all your uh, dreams into hoop dreams and put all your eggs into one basket and it doesn't work out, where do you end up going? And um, finally, uh, among Chotenyo children, soccer is a pleasure to possess. It's a seasoning that turns the bitters of everyday life into a divine meal worth having seconds. But again, what happens when you invest all your resources into the one dream that you have, and there's, it, it's, it's rough. And I, this is probably something, uh, oh, is it one minute? No, okay, sorry. Uh, this is probably something that we'll get at uh, with the Q&A, but it was really hard interviewing uh, children and almost asking them, what happens if you don't make this, if you don't make it? Because the reality is a lot of them won't, and that's a question that I wish I asked them. So. There's that. Sorry, thank you for being so patient. <laughs> Hi, 
Um, uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Rafael Lima um, from Wake Forest University, and I'll be presenting about the Brazilian indigenous struggle uh, for land demarcation. So a little bit of historical background. Uh, the indigenous population of Brazil, they have been a uh, marginalized, ostracized group in Brazil for most of the country's history. Uh, you can see here in the map that most of the officially demarcated territories are in the northern por portion of the country, and that is because uh, during colonial times, the Portuguese conquistadors, they, they just, uh, they just took uh, indigenous territories along the coast and like forced them to, to flee into mainland Brazil. Uh, although most of the indigenous people are uh, located in the north region of Brazil, we still can see that there are some of the indigenous presence in the northeast of Brazil and more specifically in the state of Mato Grosso do Sul. You can see uh, a little bit over there as well. And I wanted to focus on those two specific territories because uh, something that I, during my reporting, uh, I felt like the indigenous people in the northern portion of Brazil, they received most of the news attention, the spotlight when it comes to fight for indigenous territories. And those other people that do not necessarily live in the northern portion of Brazil uh, were not as sought after as some other indigenous groups. So the first indigenous village I visited was the Catu dos Aleutérios, and one of the first things that stood out to me, as you can see on the lower left picture, uh, the pathway to their village was filled with sugarcane plant fields. And the increasing presence of sugarcane fields in the indigenous territory, in the indigenous territory of the Catu people, was what prompted them to try to demarcate their, their area in 2005. Uh, to officially have their land recognized as an uh, indigenous territory. However, um, after like countless and countless uh, requests to the government, they haven't really received any response for why they haven't even been uh, considered for an indigenous territory. And in this, we are talking about a constitutional right uh, according to the 1988 Brazilian constitution that says that indigenous uh, groups have the right to their traditional land. So for the Catudos del Alterio people, uh, the presence of sugarcane fields have threatened the, the feasibility of the Catu River, which has historical and socioeconomical importance for them. And the Kurumins, which are their children, like uh, like Karolin uh, Karinian in here, uh, they were recently uh, prohibited from going to the river due to the pollutants and the kinds of chemicals that the sugarcane uh, companies are using in the area. So it's a situation that if continues to develop, the Katu River might uh, be unfeasible for, for the use or even dry out eventually. Uh, another indigenous group that I visited was the Sachi Trabanda village, which was a little further down, <laughs> is still within the state of Rio Grande do Norte. And that village, uh, unlike the Catu de Zelotérios, they were actually able to start a process to demarcate their territory. So a process was starting in 2016. Uh, however, due to threats to death threats to Cacique Manuel and death threats to the members of the technical study group that were sent there to that territory. Uh, this process was delayed and postponed uh, various times over the past two and a half years. And I'd like to read the quote by one of the members of that village, uh, Zeru, who said that the, uh, the Cacique Manuel was threatened by the plant members, by the plant members and by the business owners here in the community. They came by Kasiki's house, a car from the plant stopped by his door to threaten us. So we are in this situation. For as long as the government doesn't demarcate the land, we will be threatened anyway. And this really, this really reflects like where they are standing right now, because since their, their territory is not really official, uh, they cannot really seek for governmental protection, and they were kind of like exposed for action from outsiders. And I even tried to reach out to Cacique Manuel, who uh, declined uh, many times to talk with me due to being worried about uh, those death threats. And something that has kind of heightened the, the conflicts between indigenous people and some agribusiness, 
agribusiness owners was the election of President uh, Jair Bolsonaro, who even before uh, running for, pres for presidency said that he was not going to allow a single square centimeter of indigenous territory during his mandate. And which is a promise that he is upholding up to this point, like 10 months into uh, his administration, no new indigenous territory has been demarcated. So uh, villages like the, those two ones that I'm, I showed to you, they haven't really been able to keep the process going or, or uh, find a resolution for their carries. Uh, another village that really um, stuck out to me about uh, the sorts of uh, violence and, and actions that these indigenous people are are prone to receiving was the Inveragasu village. So this is not really a traditional village per se. Like as you can see here in the map, it's more kind of like a settlement of improvised like shacks from indigenous individuals that don't really have like a place to go. That just like sort of like gumble themselves together in that place, like waiting for the government to provide like an adequate land for them. And you can see that towards the left, you have like some farms towards like the, the, the bottom, you have like the city and up top you have another indigenous village. And these people, they are there like living by the, by the side of the interstate. And one thing that really stuck out to me was uh, Cacique Ambrosio, Cacique, which is uh, quite equivalent for, for chief in Portuguese. Uh, being uh, a victim of one of these attacks, not by uh, by a, a farmer or a agribusiness owner, but by another indigenous uh, individual that was sent there. And he said, Ambrosio, I uh, have things to settle with you. And as soon as he finished saying it, he started kicking me here as Cacique Ambrosio pointed to his chest. Thankfully, just the tip hit me. It wasn't a full blow. I started running, shoving things out of my way, and I fell. After I fell, he raised his foot and kicked me to break it, pointing him to his healing broken jaw. And as I met him, uh, his jaw was still recovering and he wasn't even uh, on a solid diet yet. He was still like uh, uh, feeding himself off of liquids. And this really uh, kind of showed the cruelty of the violence of the, that these indigenous people are kind of uh, prone to receiving. And how do I play this? I did, basically, I didn't go, yeah. <laughs> um, I tried that as well, and then... Yeah. Well, uh, this was a, a quick video to show kind of like the, the village that Cacique Ambrosio lived in. Uh, here you can kind of see a panoramic of the farms on the other side of the village and you would like pretty much like, see like some improvised tracks from them. And to close, uh, the Panambila Coahica village uh, shows uh, the kind of like landless uh, position of those indigenous group in which the Kasiki Ezekiel Jumon and his family, they were displaced from their village three times since 2005. They were displaced 2005, 2009 and 2015 again, and he was really, really critical of the government's role in allowing uh, such things to happen because as President Bolsonaro uh, took office, uh, he said that outsiders feel like they have more leeway and less punishment to to enter indigenous village when solicited. And I know I throw a lot of things at you, but I'm glad to ask your questions afterwards. I'm from the City Colleges of Chicago, uh, and I'm here to talk about the Nepalese American identity here in the United States. Uh, so I want to be a little transparent from the beginning here. I sent the wrong presentation, so some of these slides are a little incomplete. So if you notice anything off the rails, don't worry, I will explain it. Uh, don't worry about the slides. Just letting you guys know ahead of time. Uh, so we're going to start off here in Nepal. 
Um, this is just an image of one of the villages, so I'm not sure if I could just get a quick raise of hands. How many people here are familiar with the country of Nepal? Oh, nice. Okay, way more than I was expecting. So, um, I'm originally from Nepal. I grew up here, but uh, what my project really centers around is this idea of identity within America. Something that I see and I happen to have a lot of conversations with uh, is about our American identity. What do we think of ourselves as Americans? How do we consider the values and the cultures that make us American? But coming from the perspective of someone who is uh, also Nepalese, I felt that it is hard for me to distinguish what values come from one tradition or culture versus one that I grew up out of, ended up learning having lived here in the United States. So my goal was to go to different uh, spaces in the United States and see what other Nepalese Americans thought it meant to be American for themselves and what it also meant to be a Nepalese American at that. So here is a uh, video of my, well, I'm not sure if it'll play. So this is a video of uh, my uncle who lives in New York and he is playing what is known as the sarangi. So this is a traditional Nepalese instrument. It is like a little violin. Um, I'm assuming the audio is just playing. So it works a little bit like a violin. It is made of coarse strings, uh, fish scales, and all of it uh, is put together to make melodic music. So uh, just moving on from that, uh, what I wanted to say was that so music is a big part of culture. It is a way that we bring our roots over. Um, so this is something that my uncle had learned how to play back in Nepal. And bringing it over here, he felt that it was a way for him to express himself as a Nepalese American. Uh, when I asked him personally about it, he said that he had learned it when he was growing up, going to different villages in Nepal. And having grown up here now, uh, he brings it to be able to play within the Nepalese community that exists in New York. So there is a whole society for, that is called the Tomu Society. Um, and within that community, they have uh, various events for different festivities known as like Dasang, Tihar, uh, Baitika. And all of these events are basically ways for the community to round together. And it's a way for him to feel like a much bigger part of that community. Um, so one of the things that I did want to look at, though, uh, and that I asked myself was, what is the difference between the older and the younger generation that exists here in the United States, uh, at least amongst the Nepalese Americans? Because I had found through a lot of my own like anecdotal um, conversations that a lot of the young people didn't feel that it necessarily mattered what it meant to be American and didn't see a difference between being American and Nepalese, whereas the older generation definitely felt much more at home within being uh, Nepalese. So this is just the reason I went to New York and Dallas is because within New York and Dallas it had the two highest population of Nepalese people, at least according to the 2011 census data that I was able to recover. Um, so when looking at where to, where to actually go and find uh, the densest population of Nepalese Americans, I decided to go to these areas. So my first destination took me to Jackson Heights uh, in Queens, New York. Jackson Heights is actually a historically immigrant neighborhood. Um, it is completely diverse and has a ton of different cultures. I believe over 167 different languages are spoken there. And actually something that I found out through a documentary that I uh, watched was that within Jackson Heights, there's always like a new generation of immigrants that is coming in and actually taking over. And what I found is that the Nepalese immigrants that had started there um, in, the, in the beginning, they had come over and they had started these food trucks. So here's an image of one of the Papala food trucks. And this just sells Nepalese street food, such as momos. I'm not sure if anyone here is familiar, but they are just basically dumplings. Um, and what I found is that they made their way up. They moved from food trucks up into restaurants, up into owning different types of businesses. Um, so Jackson Heights seemed to be like a beautiful location for people to settle down in. And a lot of the people that I'd interviewed and asked, they told me that the reason they came to Jackson Heights in the first place wasn't because of this cultural diversity that they signified. It wasn't for any particular reason other than within Jackson Heights, there were other Nepalese people that invited them to come over. Um, so then where, I, where it took me next was I found that there was like a little Nepalese learning center um, called the United Sherpa Association. So it was inside of this building underneath a basement, so you had to walk down. I was a little surprised at first because I expected 
there to be like a nice temple or a church. But once you get inside, the entire building was fantastic. Here are some of the people that I met. Um, they all related from like the children to the parents. And when I originally walked in, uh, none of the none of the uh, none of the parents knew me. They all kind of saw me, and I sat down, and I was like, "Hi, is there anyone I can speak to?" And uh, once they saw that I was Nepalese and t talked to me, I started asking them questions about, "Well, what do you feel like it means to be American here?" And a lot of the older uh, parents, once I had had this conversation with them, they told me that amongst them, they felt that between them and their children, they were a sandwiched generation. So for them, their parents are of 100% Nepalese value, and their children are growing up here in America, and they are sandwiched in between the center. And it's very difficult for them to understand what values they want to pass on and which ones they can control or not control between them. And when I spoke to some of the children as well, they, uh, they expressed the same sentiment. Uh, there were various different um, identity crises, I would say, but they're not extremely drastic. But amongst themselves, they felt that they didn't know whether or not uh, they could express themselves as being Nepalese or not. Um, so this is a video as well. I don't think it's going to... Oh. This is just a little example of the, the learning class that they had. So she's just teaching them how to turn. Something that I think we can all <laughs> learn how to do. <laughs> so moving on, this is just a, a plaque of all of the founders and all of all the people that uh, who uh, are a part of the community. And within Nepal itself, um, I just want to mention that there are a ton of different cultures. And so here is where uh, a lot of the students would learn how to speak Nepalese. There would be a teacher who sits on the right side and then students would surround while learning how to speak uh, Nepalese from one instructor. The class size is usually about 20 kids, but that's only if the parents were able to bring them along for the day. Um, there's some religious figures up in the corner. And then so here's a picture of someone that I had met. She was a young woman named Serena Gurung that worked uh, within the Nepalese community there. And she had told me that, uh, she gave me something that I felt really uh, emphasized what the younger generation felt that you don't there are no cultural markers to being Nepalese, that being Nepalese and being American are both how you feel. If you feel that you are that way, then that is what you are. Um, and then here's another uh, group that I've met, or father-daughter duo that I like to call them. So this is Raj and Preeti. So Raj is the father on the right, and Preeti is the daughter on the left. And while I was having a conversation with them, it seemed to me that uh, Raj felt that he was 96% Nepalese. He had been here since 2006, and when I asked him why he felt that way, he told me that there are just some parts of his culture that he could not um, take away. Anyways, my time is up. Thank you, guys. I went to <clears throat> Kispiakta, which is uh, an indigenous community in Peru in the highlands there in the Andes. Um, and I'm going to kind of break my presentation loosely into um, two categories. One is kind of the, the newsy spine of the story that I pursued, and the other is kind of the like narrative meat of that spine. Um, but I'll get the facts, the, the factoids out of the way first. So I went to Kispiakta. This is how we got there. Um, this Land Rover's name is Antonio. Candy apple green. Um, old healthy guy with bailing wire and tape. Uh, that's Milton, my uh, translator. I don't speak Spanish. Uh, they, they spoke uh, Quechua in Spanish. Uh, that's Lydia. Um, Marcella was on the right up front, and Almancia was our driver for um, the three weeks we were there, um, 50 soles a day. We spent a lot of time with them. Um, Kispiakta is one of the higher communities in the Peruvian Andes. Uh, they lost their glaciers in the 70s, and so they rely, um, this is Kispiakta, um, they rely uh, on the uh, uh, rainfall during the rainy season, which they're now entering to irrigate their crops and they, um, their uh, subsistence community primarily. 
um, and it's high and dry. Um, and so what they uh, have noticed with climate change, um, and they attribute primarily, most of the people attribute climate change to um, uh, uh, its human trigger. Uh, what they're doing is they're building these lakes, um, coaches. And so they're using um, actually ancestral techniques to build these lakes. They started building them in the 90s after they returned uh, to their community from uh, after the uh, political violence started to settle the shining path in the military conflict. Uh, and they started building these using, um, yeah, just, just traditional techniques. Uh, and so they find these lagunas or these natural depressions in these valleys high up in the mountains and they dam the downhill side of them. And over the course of two or three or maybe four or five years, they build up into these massive lakes that normally wouldn't be there and they support these um, very diverse ecosystems. They're actually, I found out late, um, this is probably another story, but they're um, these kind of uh, speed, or uh, like homes, temporary homes for migratory birds um, going from North to South America and vice versa. And so they're building these, they built about 60 since the 90s. Um, they're very inexpensive to build. Um, and uh, it's amazing, they, the water pools and then it presses through the earth. It, it uh, kind of revitalizes the soil locally, um, uh, hydrating it. And then it also trickles And it does that all throughout the valley, and from afar they, they look kind of like a, a necklace of blue beads. It's really incredible. Um, they're having, I thought this was going to be like a central conflict line in the story. Uh, it, it's not. But the state was destroying, they destroyed two of them because they thought they could build them better using cement and bulldozers. Um, and you can see before and after. Uh, but that's a conflict that's mostly being resolved now. Um, so that's what they're doing to adapt with climate change. Um, but they perceive climate change. Like I said, they don't deny uh, anthropogenic climate change. Um, but they perceive it, it differently than, than Westerners probably do. Time for them is not linear, primarily. Um, it's cyclical. And so let me just glance at my notes make sure I'm staying on track. Um, they, they believe that past events repeat themselves. Um, and these pictures don't so much relate to what I'm saying, other than that they have circles in them. Um, <laughs> another circle. Um, they, yeah, so they believe that past events repeat themselves, um, and you know, the, the, the political conflicts in the, throughout the 80s that displaced a lot of this community was actually born from Chusji, which is the neighboring village of Kispiakta. Um, and the, the lingering trauma there is, is a whole nother story. Um, actually, it's part of the story, but it's for another talk. Um, kids playing at night. Uh, and uh, so there's this concept of moyui, um, time looping on itself. Uh, and a new cycle uh, began when their glacier melted in the 70s. This is uh, the community, sub-community of Tuco, about, about 14,500 feet. Um, and this, this event, they believe, triggered um, climate change today when their glacier melted. Uh, and it, it uh, following their glaciers melting in the 70s, uh, extreme drought settled on their community. They couldn't even find water. They were battling with livestock for water, the humans versus the livestock for the water. Um, and then the political conflict sprang from that, or not from that, but following that um, through the 80s. And now, Climate change is very pronounced, and it's uh, starving them of their of their rains. Um, and I, we wanted to find someone who could <clears throat> tell us what the glacier was like when it was there. And we interviewed him in his house. No electricity, just this candle and the fire in the bottom right. Um, Dionisio, he's around 80. He remembers the glacier, and it was a uh, um, a fascinating interview uh, because I couldn't see his face, just sometimes the glint of his jaw. But it was just it was one of those moments, you know, you might never have another one like that. Um, and he told us an interesting fable. This moon was above his house. Um, more than 2,000 years ago, uh, this cycle they're going through, it, it first appeared. Um, and there was a group of people called the Aya. And they lived all throughout the Andes, um, both the uh, Pacific and Atlantic basins. Uh, and they began to disrespect 
the natural world and the rule of law, and they were told by some elders that if they didn't repent, that God, that Catholic God, would uh, fashion two more sons, and then they would they would bake to death. And they were like, yeah, yeah, whatever. Um, and so as it heated up, they fled to the mountains, um, and they fled to the rivers, hoping to survive, um, but they didn't, and um, they died. And so this cycle, the climate change, um, which we probably, most of us view through a, a literal and scientific frame, they view it through this apocalypse fable, um, through this concept of muy, muy um, and so it's, it's this cycle, it happened a long time ago, before Christ, they believe, that's repeating, um, for the same reason that we're disrespecting uh, the natural world, um, and also, oh, one minute. Um, no, that's, uh, shouldn't have taken that out, that was pretty photo. Um, and so I went into a classroom and I had kids, I wanted to know what, what the generation is gonna experience this most, the effects of climate change, how they perceive this, this fable, and it's, it's deeply permeated in their culture. And so I went into a classroom and had kids, about 30 young kids, illustrate this. Um, and these are good visual references. I hope to collaborate with a, an illustrator on this story um, to, to bring to life this, this fable, this myth. Um, this was a really fun exercise. Uh, they were all pretty rosy, except for this guy. <laughs> Um, he was very proud of his work. I thought he did a great job. Um, and we, ner we learned that there were some bones of the Aya uh, down by a river, and we wanted to see, like, well, you know, is that, that can't be the case. So we walked across this vast grassy plain down to this river. Uh, there's these uh, kind of haunted trees. This is a sickness. And there are these bones. Um, I'm not aware of them being carbon dated, but uh, they, they claim that these are the Aya. And then I want to work with this illustrator who personifies... Um, Mesopotamian legends just exclusively. David Alvarez, and then that's me. Thank you all. Very nicely done, all of you. Good. Uh, let's go to questions now. Hi, I'm Mariana Rivas, and I am from TCU. My question is for Autumn. Um, so I was wondering if you, um, why you chose Ecuador, and if you found similarities in other South American countries. Sure. Um, okay. So I chose Ecuador because in last uh, winter I went on a study abroad there, and the purpose of the study abroad was to understand the Black experience, not only in America but globally. And so we traveled to Chota, which is where uh, the majority of, if, if it's not Chota, it's uh, the Esmeraldas, which is where the Afro-Ecuadorians are. Uh, and so I chose Chota for that reason, because I had been there before, and I saw, and I lived with them, and I just figured that I would go back. Um, as far as seeing parallels in other South American countries, or just uh, countries in general, um, Definitely in, in, in South America, I would say, uh, when you look at the Olympics and all those other like World Cup teams, you will absolutely see all these you know, black people who seem like they just came out of nowhere, but they've been living there for the whole, you know, for a while, the African diaspora, slavery. Oh, I sh probably should have mentioned, um, the folks from Chota are direct descendants of enslaved Africans who came sometime in the 1600s, so uh, there's that. But, uh, yeah, as far as the African diaspora, uh, you know, did its thing. Uh, yeah, black people are everywhere, and they're they're killing it in the sports world. But that's what I argue, and what it seems like a lot of other people agreed with is that uh, the reason why they're so uh, overrepresented in sports is because opportunities are slim, and you know, representation uh, shows. You know, you see yourself as a basketball player compared to maybe a neurosurgeon because you don't know or have never seen that before. So, yeah, the body as a commodity, um, themes like that just came to mind. So, there's that. Um, I'm still nervous. Thank you for being so patient. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have a question? Um, oops. I'm Lily Moore Eisenberg. I'm from Yale. And I have a question for Dan. I have read about um, indigenous communities 
Quechua communities in Peru uh, and this trend that in the past few years, some of them who, that have been self-sustaining have gotten involved with like urban economies. And as a result, that's sort of like a downward spiral because they no longer can sustain themselves. And I was wondering if that was a dynamic that you observed at all. And if not, what was their economic relationship with other parts of the country? I don't know. <laughs> um, I didn't explore the economy of their community um, at all, really. It was, some, it was something I was curious about, but um, it was it was difficult not speaking Spanish. Mi español es muy malo. Um, uh, but but they were it was they were so they had they had a problem in their eyes of um, the younger generation leaving to to go to um, Wamanga, which is the capital of Ayacucho, which is the district they're in, um, and that was a problem because they were losing the opportunity to pass on their culture, which they were trying to rebuild after the political violence um, and revalue, re, um, reprioritize. Uh, but they were they were um, economically uh, uh, um, self-sufficient in a lot of ways. Their, their homes they make of adobe, um, and they, they construct them using communal labor. labor. Um, no one's paid except in reciprocity. Um, and they grow a lot of their own food. They import, like, they have, uh, in a lot of the sub-communities, they have uh, staples of grocery stores, like tangerines and bananas, and they bring those from the Amazon, I think. But um, I don't know. I can't answer that question too well. Okay, more questions? Um, I have a question for Ursus. Um, my, oh, my name is Nikhil. I'm from UChicago. Um, Nikhil Mendel of Parthi <laughs> from UChicago. <laughs> Um, I'm curious, among the people you talk to um, in the Nepalese community, whether there is a sense of identifying with like a broader like South Asian identity or, or even like Asian American. Because I know at least in Queens, there's huge Bengali population, Indo-Caribbean. Like, uh, yeah, so that's actually a really good question. Um, so what I found is that amongst the younger generation, definitely. I mean, in South Asia, like Bollywood is the main entertainment industry. So a lot of kids grow up learning Hindi. So a lot of the kids that grow up in Nepal end up learning like three or four different languages. It'll be English, it'll be Nepalese, it'll be Hindi, and then whatever their caste language is. So we've got like very multilingual people there. But when it comes to relating to other South Asian cultures, a lot of the uh, older generation, I find, tends to look at India in, um, in, in a much different way because historically what they see it as, they see it as an attack on the Nepalese state. So because of that, there's a lot of older people that harbor a level of resentment where that I don't see within the younger generation. Hi, my name's Emma Johnson. I'm from the Yale School of Forestry. My question's also for you, Ursus. I'm wondering if you saw differences in identity based on why people were moving to America in the first place. So if people were fleeing from a persecution of some sort, if they're doing it by choice, if they came already like having an economic or job opportunity and what those differences, how if they manifested an identity? Uh, that's a great question. So most of the people that I met uh, fled because of economic insecurity. That's the main reason that they came to the United States. However, I would say that in 2014, there was the uh, natural disaster that happened in Nepal, the earthquake. And because of that, there was a ton of relief work that was done. And there were a ton of Nepalese refugees, but most of them didn't come to the United States or, uh, or anything like that, they most of them went over to, uh, what is it called, Bhutan. And that's where a ton of Nepalese refugees live now because of that natural disaster. However, the ones that I met here in the United States, most of them do come for more for economic opportunity. Um, so my name is Caitlin Johnson and I go to Georgetown. Um, so my question is for all of you or anyone who would like to answer. Um, oftentimes identity is really closely tied with language so um, what languages do each of you speak and how, um, and what languages did the communities you were working with speak and how did this play into your reporting? I can start. Um, I speak English and, and sometimes poorly. Uh, they spoke Spanish in Quechua um, and I had a translator, Milton, who spoke English uh, and Spanish. Um, and I had to learn ways to communicate outside of language um, to express just, you know, the normal things you express when you're 
I don't know, uh, to, to build a relationship. Um, and so, and so we, my sources, the people you saw on uh, Antonio, the Land Rover, uh, we uh, um, developed kind of a language outside of spoken language and, and we were able to communicate that. And then when we had to exchange information formally, um, we did it through a translator, but it prevented me from, from doing um, just as, as a, a you know, good reporter does, just speaking with strangers and, and asking them questions, trying to have the many exchanges. I wasn't able to do that. Um, well, um, I'm from Brazil, so I speak both English and Portuguese, and all the indigenous villages I, I visited, they all spoke Portuguese as well. Uh, some of them uh, better than, than others, but all with like a great level of clarity. And it was actually interesting uh, that you touched on that because even like talking with like other Brazilians, they did not really have that notion that uh, the indigenous people in Brazil spoke Portuguese. They were like, how were you able to, to interview them? And I was like, I spoke with them. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and it just like, it really made me realize like some of the biases that the, the Brazilian society as a whole had. Uh, towards the indigenous people, and I include myself into that as well. Like I, I checked like lots of biases I had uh, during my my reporting as well. But definitely this question of like language uh, was something that like the outsider perspective really surprised me. Um, so I speak English and a little bit of broken Spanish, um, just from being in New York, and uh, I use a translator. But I found that once we were communicating and uh, my narrators were recounting their stories, uh, we were able to communicate through that. Like one of my narrators, uh, Ileana, talked about how in middle school, uh, they would always play this game called the wolf and they would always make her play the role of the wolf which chased around all the little girls. And um, in a story like that, and it was tough even asking it because you can see her recalling the moment and stuff like that. But as you mentioned um, with nonverbal communication, uh, when she told that story, I kind of related, and from there, we, she would be talking about things, and she didn't know the name in Spanish even, and I would say, well, in, in English, we call that colorism, and she was like, colorism, and I explained deep as color, and she was like, yeah, yeah, that's what that is, and so we found ways to communicate in that way. Um, I think that's because I related. <laughs> Maybe that helps some. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I, I, I think you're right in saying that language is really important to our identities and I say for my reporting it was more dependent on what language they felt the most comfortable speaking in. So I speak both English and Nepalese, um, but my Nepalese is a lot more conversational than it is anything like proper. So I don't know how to speak uh, extraordinarily well, but I can get through a conversation. Uh, and so when I was talking to the adults within that uh, Nepalese learning center, there they were able to speak with me in Nepalese because that's how they felt the most comfortable. And they told me that one of the biggest reasons they had that in the first place is because, like they said earlier, they had wanted their children to be able to communicate with their grandparents. And that was something that they didn't want them to lose touch with. Um, because, like you were saying, it's very core to like, the identity of who they are. I think we have time for one more question. Hi, I'm Patrick Ammerman from UPenn. I also have a question for the whole group. Um, so I got the impression that all of you were telling the story about some, someone from the perspective of how they perceive their identity, and yet you all also came in with your own ideas about an interest in their identity. So I'm wondering when you sit down to make the final product, like how do you think about your own interest and experience and versus trying to uh, explain how the people you interviewed would describe their experience, if that makes sense. Well, one thing I kept in mind, or I, I'm still editing, so I'm keeping it in mind, is uh, show, don't tell. Like, it's fine if I feel this way, but what do my narrators have to say about it? And um, how can we use their voice to, because I try to get out the way. It's not about me. I'm just the person in between sharing the story. Uh, so I keep that in mind not about me. Hmm. <laughs> what about you guys? Uh, I'm, I'm going to say I think that's, that's something that I had a lot of trouble with, actually. 
um, because one, this is about people that I feel like personally connected to. So in a way, there's a similarity there, but there are also factors that I think that my own identity gets in the way. Being an American and not being 100% Nepalese, I feel that there is this like tug and pull relationship where there's some values that I have here that make me maybe a little bit more progressive, I would say, in some mindsets that I didn't see coming from like an older generation. So there were some difficulties sometimes when, like I think the uh, question that Nikhil had asked me, when they were mentioning stuff about like maybe intercaste relationships, um, I had to personally hold back a little bit and ask them, well, why do you feel that way? Rather than coming at them from a place of judgment or uh, not misunderstanding. Um. Yeah, so that was something that I definitely kept in mind as well, uh, being Brazilian, and definitely because it's an issue that right now in Brazil is very polarized by, by various political issues, and you have uh, uh, a lot of like prominent uh, political figures waiting on that issue like uh, on pretty much on like a weekly basis, and I really try to not. Um, uh, put forward any any sort of like political judgment from from my behalf, but at the same time, I I didn't want to to just be totally neutral and and be like, oh, well, I'll I'll let this story un unravel and you 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 see what happens because uh, serious things are happening with indigenous people. Like these people, they are uh, exposed and they are under threat. So like. Um, outsider sources or because the government is not doing what it's supposed to do under the constitution. So I cannot really like uh, forego all of that just for the sake of being like totally neutral. Uh, but at the same time, I, I really wanted to not politicize the subject, but like show it as objective uh, as I could. Uh, not, <clears throat> this might sound off, but that I'm not telling their story, I'm telling a story that involves their story. Um, and so I try to ask open-ended questions and, and let them drive the interviews as much as I can while, while still getting my questions answered. But then when I sit down behind my laptop and write, I'm not editorializing, but I'm, I'm, it's a very subjective frame that I'm applying, and I, I think that definitely has its downfalls, and, and I try to be, I think a, a good journalist um, tries to take everything they learn in the field to drive the framing, but you also have to regain a fair amount of control of, of the, the narrative and the frame yourself, because that's important because you're telling it, or I mean, uh, most of us are probably telling it for our, our for a Western audience, and so you can kind of bridge the two cultures, but that's tough because there's inevitably going to be bias. Okay, well, thank you very much.